with me in your Bibles right away to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we're just cruising through. Actually, we're not cruising. We're just inching our way through, actually. <laughs> and so I, I, had, I, was gonna, I was hoping to finish the first chapter, but uh, not to be. You know how that goes. But um, it's just so good. It's just so rich, man. You can only take so much. So I just I hope the Lord and pray that he uses it in our lives and just you know, strengthens us and edifies us. So First Timothy, and um, I will read verses 12 through 17. That's our text this morning. Paul says this, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted in ignorance and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To this to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Father in heaven, yes, we do thank you and praise you so much and for this precious word and, and how you've taken us out of darkness into your marvelous light. We're so undeserving and yet you've seen fit to give us life. And I just pray that we would overflow with gratitude and love and obedience, Lord, to you because of what you've done for us and in us and, and what you're doing through us. So please bless this time. Bless this message, Lord God. I pray that you would be with each and every one of us by your spirit. Illuminate our hearts and minds. Help us to, to, to stay focused on your word today and on, and on you, Lord. I pray that you would be with me to bring your word in, in a way that honors and glorifies you. Um, understand just, just how insufficient I am, but Lord, you are sufficient. So we look to you and give you thanks and praise in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Good. Okay. Remember last week we explained uh, like the proper use and function of the law because there were people at that time coming into the congregation who Timothy needed to confront because they were bringing in bad teachings. That's part of our jobs as, as, as elders is to protect the flock from bad teaching. You know, we need to protect you in many ways. And that's one of the primary ways is not let that get a hold in the congregation. That's when you go, start going south. Teachers were coming in, teaching different things. And we got the indication last week that they were teaching about the law certain ways like trying to keep the law in order to earn God's favor and promise, all that kind of stuff. So no, no, that's not the way. But we, we understood and saw last week that the, the, the real function, primary function of the law of God, of the commandments, is not to, for us to kind of keep them and say, oh, look, I could do this, God, or, or look how hard I'm trying. Please take that into consideration. No, no, no. It's to say, I can't do this. I can't. I'm I, I'm convicted by this. I can no way, I can't even begin to keep this perfectly. I can't, there's no way. So, so it drives us to Christ who kept the law for us. The law can't save you, only grace. Paul knows this all too well. And in this section this morning, it's just like a real praise to the Lord. He just breaks out and just thanks the Lord for the salvation that was brought to him. So this morning, we're just going to get a glimpse of the transforming power of the grace of the gospel in Paul's brief testimony. And I just want you to get that and just sense the joy that Paul has, the depth, the overflowing gratitude of being in Christ. And that's this. It's almost like he breaks off from what he's teaching to to it's like a little interlude to just praise God for a salvation that he has in Christ. He's so uh, overwhelmed by by the grace that he's received through Christ. So he's deeply and profoundly affected by the gospel. And that's, we should all be like that, right? Don't you, I just long for that, to be so deeply moved by the gospel of Christ because of what he's done for us and in us so that we, we get to live for him and not for ourselves. That's not the case too often. Anyway, that's what Paul is bringing forth. All credit, honor, glory to God. Paul fit into that category of last week of verse 7. Um, 
when it says, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they made confident assertions. Paul fit into that as a Pharisee. He made confident assertions about the law. He was better than most of his buddies in terms of bringing forth the law. So he, he knows that's what he's talking of that of which he's speaking. So um, even in uh, Philippians 3, verses 4 to 6, Paul says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, just like he's talking about here in Timothy. Um, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless, Right. But he realizes that was garbage. He goes on to say everything I have, that was nothing. That meant nothing because and I know the truth now in Christ. So looking back, Paul could see just how wrong he was about what he taught so fervently, what he believed in so much. And he saw how gracious God is to us. I think every Christian, we should all of us should be able to relate to this to one degree or another. Right. Paul says, man, he just says, I thank him who's given me strength. I thank him. Right? He's thankful. And that means to be in awe. And we should, every day, we should be in awe of what we have and who we are. And because Jesus Christ loves you that much, you should be just stunned with amazement that he could love you the way he does and what he has done for you and for us. Paul says, I am thankful even though this is what I was before. Even, and we could say that. I'm so thankful because I know what I was before Christ came into my life. Even though those things that I did, the way that I thought, and still do to a degree, he loves me. So Paul just starts out by thanking the Lord. It's just amazingly, right? Just thankful. I thank him who has given me strength. Paul takes no credit for everything that he does, for the strength and the power that he has. It comes from God. To minister effectively comes from him. The boldness to say what needs to be said, to, to, to speak the truth, to, the willingness to take a strong stand on a, on a very controversial subject or something that's very unpopular at the time. You know, man, that takes boldness. That takes strength. He's thanking the Lord for the strength to, to minister in that way, to confront evil straight on. You know what it's like when you see a very effective Christian or somebody who's so bold for the faith and, and you just admire that because they're strong and they're not afraid and they're courageous and they're doing what, what we're supposed to do as Christians. What do you say to that person? Man, you are so bold. You're so strong in the Lord. I love that. What's that Christian's response to you all the time about the strength? It's not me, right? It's the Lord. That's the only proper response there is because that's where our strength comes from and that's when we're effective, when we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That's good. Paul says, I thank you. No credit to me. Don't look to me. Don't build me up. The things that I'm doing where they're effective are by the grace of God. It's his strength. Right? He goes on to say, Christ in his strength, Christ Jesus, our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Again, he judged Paul faithful. That leaves us in absolute wonder at the grace of God because we know ourselves like Paul. Paul knew this. He was judged faithful and appointed him to serve. Not because Paul had a sparkling resume as, as a Christian guy, right? He wasn't that kind of person who said, hey, look at everything that I've done. Now put me into your service. It was just the opposite. What was Paul's resume? Well, Paul tells us, man, though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent opponent. That's big time opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not something that would commend you to being in the service of the Lord. He's not going to look at that and say, okay, man, that's great. Come, come and join my team. That's not why. It's all the grace of God. Paul said, I was a blasphemer. You know what that means? That's, that's such a, a really, really strong word. It's, it's so hard to communicate the depth of the word and what it means. It's to like profane the name of God, to, to hate the name of God. Paul, he thought he loved God, didn't he? Right. He was going around preaching under the law, the, 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 the law of God in that way. But actually, a blasphemer means great disrespect and dishonor towards God and towards the thing of God, the things of God. Just 
just very volitional and, and, and a real hatred towards the things of towards God and the things of God. Paul in Acts 26, 11 said this, I punished them, he's talking about Christians, often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. I wanted them to deny him. I wanted them to disrespect deeply the name of God. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. He was a persecutor. It goes on to Acts 2, 22, 4. Paul says this. Did I not give you Acts 22, 4? That's okay. It's just going to talk about him persecuting the Christians as well, going along and persecuting Christians, right? He was an insolent opponent. And, and, that, and that insolent, that's describing what kind of opponent that he was. Another very strong word. I wish I could communicate to you just the depth and the, like how deep those words are and what the hearers would really hear. When he said he was an insolent opponent, it's not just opposing, man. It's not just disliking. It's not just going against, but it's very aggressive. It's persistent in, in opposition. Just keep on going and nagging and ragging on you and getting after you, hurtful hateful, arrogant, rude, thinking you're right. You know those people, when they think they're so right that, that they can't possibly be wrong, and you're so wrong that you can't possibly be right. That's what insulin is. Just, just a really aggressive, persistent opposition against the... Th that's what Paul, that's his resume. That's what he's bringing before the Lord. That's who he was. Paul says... I thank him who's given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opposition to him. Nothing here would commend Paul to God's service or to be counted faithful because it's all about God's mercy and it's all about God's grace. Paul said, I received mercy and I was given grace. It was actually poured out. He goes on to say, Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Do you see? It's all of grace. It's all of mercy. There's nothing in and of ourselves or about us that we can commend to God to use us until and unless he changes us. Amen? That's it. And then he puts us in a circle. We're not worthy in any way. Paul said, I received mercy and was given grace. And it's just that beautiful language about being poured out to overflowing, just an abundance to be very, very satisfied with, you know, just very sufficient for, for the cause. It's not, you know, oh, I just wish I had a little bit more. No, no, no. He overflows and gives us an abundance of grace and mercy. And there's always that um, little bit... Two sides of the same coin, mercy and grace, right? Uh, grace is, is more like on the positive sense. In other words, you are given. When you receive grace, you are giving that which you do not deserve and you can't earn, okay? So your sins are forgiven. How are they forgiven? By grace alone. You can't do anything to, to commend yourself to God to say, here, God, I'm good. Now forgive my sins. No, 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 no. That's grace alone that's poured out. But Paul said he also received mercy. And that's more in the negative because mer when it comes to mercy, it's, it's that you are not given what you deserve, okay? In other words, you've committed a crime and you deserve punishment or you deserve the consequences of what happened to you. Mercy takes that away, right? So he received grace, given what you do not deserve and you can't earn. Mercy, you are not given what you deserve, the punishment or consequence for wrong. So, so Paul was shown that. This is why Paul says, I can thank him. This is where my strength comes from. This is why I'm counted faithful and used by him. So he's telling us and making sure it's nothing about us, nothing in, our, in and of ourselves. Always remember that, man. It's not about you. It's always about Christ in you. Got it? That's important. To, to, that's, that's where our strength comes from. That's where our effectiveness comes from as Christians. Once we start relying on ourselves, our own strength, our own smarts, whatever it is, we're done for. It's over. We're not going to be able to sustain that. It's through him alone. It's totally dependent upon him. You have to forget about yourself. Can you do that? It's hard because the flesh keeps fighting against that. But we're only effective when we're trusting in him alone and completely dependent on him. Yes, this is the strength. Paul says, in essence, 
I know what I was. I know what I was. I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. But now I know who he is and he knows me. So in 13b, people get tripped up over this. He says, I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. Don't get confused. Don't think that he received grace and mercy and forgiveness because he didn't know what he was doing, right? I, I didn't know how, what you know, was going on. I was ignorant and I acted in unbelief. If that's the case, then everybody would be saved because all of us some were ignorant in, in our unbelief. In a kind of change, it's like it's, it's, it's the idea of not, not being culpable, right? He, I didn't know what I was doing. So, so, so I wasn't, you know, is that, is that what he's saying here? That he acted ignorantly, that he didn't realize that he was doing wrong? Does this mean he wasn't culpable? No. Number one, because in our heart of hearts, we still know. It doesn't matter. You know and suppress the truth and unrighteousness, Romans 1 tells us. So we, in our heart of hearts, we do know when we're sinning against God and we're culpable. Acting ignorantly, check this out and listen to this. Acting ignorantly shows the, the deceitfulness of sin. That's how deceptive Satan is. That's how deceptive sin is, man. It twists our mind and it turns the truth upside down. So we believe lies, right? We think we're doing good when we're actually sinning against God. And that's the case with so many unbelievers. That's the case with you. There were times, I'm sure, in your life when you thought you were doing something just and right. It's actually a sin against the Lord, right? But you felt justified in doing that, right? That, it's deceptiveness of sin. How deep our sin runs in, in our lives until the Lord illuminates our hearts. So John 16, 2 and 3, Jesus said this kind of thing would happen. Paul, Jesus said this, they will put you out of the synagogues for believing in me. They're going to put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you thinks he's offering a service to God. You see that? That's that ignorant and unbelief idea. And they will do these things because they have not known the father nor me. They're doing it, not knowing him, thinking it they're doing for him. Romans 10, 2 and 3 says this. Paul's talking about the Jews. He says, for I bear witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. See, does that get them off the hook? Is that No, they're culpable for their sins, right? Can't say, look, if you look back on your life, you're, maybe you didn't realize the gravity of your sin when you committed it. As you do now. And maybe even felt justified when you were doing it. See, we have a great capacity to rationalize, to, to, to justify, and to minimize our sin. And then kind of look back and say, no, 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 that, that was sin. So I'll just give one example, one illustration, I guess. There could be millions of, of illustrations of this idea of, of, of rationalizing, justifying, minimizing, right? Just to think of adultery. Think, just think of that. We'll just go there because it's an easy one to get. So you have a person who, I'm not picking on the women, but I'm going to use a woman in, in the illustration. I'll get, I'll get on the men later, so I think maybe in this sermon, maybe not. But you have a woman who's just t- tired of her husband, right? Meet somebody else. And how's it go? How's, it, how's the excuse, how, how's the rational, rationalization or justifying or minimizing go? When they meet that new person, it's like, Well, this is the person I was meant to be with all along. Have you ever heard that one? This is the person I was really meant to be with, not this bozo that I'm with right now. This this, this is the one for me. My marriage was over a long time ago. And I've heard some of these as a pastor, excuses, right? Pays no attention to me, gives little time, little affection. Got married when I was young, stupid, takes me for granted, all the husbands are like freaking out now. <laughs> not looking at their wives, no eye contact. <laughs> uh, he doesn't deserve me. And so I was justified in having that affair. And I'm justified in getting that divorce because it's for me. It's my time now. It wasn't the person I thought was going to be. That sounds good. There's just that people will say, okay, yeah, you're right. And you're mistreated. That's right. You know, where was that effect? You're justified in that. You know it's not justification. You're still culpable. Right? I know many, some, who've done that, especially before being converted to Christ, looking back saying, no, 
I could see now. I acted ignorant, ignorantly in unbelief. Still culpable because I still committed the sin. You understand? You've been there. The university professor who's intent on deconstructing Christianity, who's later converted, sees that. How, how violently and wickedly they acted towards Christianity. And now, as a Christian, they say, wait a minute, I was wrong. I acted ignorantly and believed. The escort at the abortion clinic who bring young women up to, to get an abortion, thinking they're doing right, thinking they're just, right? This is good. I'm sticking up for this person who's converted later on, sees, no, I wasn't. That was sin. I acted ignorantly in unbelief. It doesn't get us off the hook. You're still culpable, but it speaks to the grace of God. Because looking back, and check this out, looking back, you see how sinful you were and how great his grace and mercy is to you. Amen? Because those sins are forgiven. That's the thing here. That's what Paul says. That's the meaning when he says, I acted ignorantly in unbelief. Because of that, Not no. Right? He's culpable, but Christ has paid for those sins. And looking back, Paul saw who he truly was and who he was up against. It's just amazing. I, I, I'm not communicating the way I want to, the depth of this, man. Okay. Am I, Chuck? I don't know. Okay. Um, goes on to verse 15, and he says this. The saying, this. the saying is a trustworthy one, deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. And then he goes on to the, to, to the doxology. But verse 15 begins one of one, the first of five trustworthy statements Throughout this epistle. And they're just really summaries of truth. So Paul's breaking off from his teaching in a sense. And just exalting the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And giving a testimony of, of, of what Christ has done for him. So we're being encouraged. And he goes on and he says this man. Look this is a trustworthy saying. This is the truth. You need to believe this. this is a summary of truth. What is it? That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. What's that? That's the gospel. Nothing else can save. That is why he came. That's the essence of the gospel. You don't know how to preach the gospel? Say that. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost, and you are too. That's why he came. Not merely to be an example for people. Oh, Christ came to be a wonderful example. We can learn from him how to treat fellow man. No, that's not why he came. He didn't come to simply show a better way. Oh, follow Jesus' way and life will be better for you, right? That's not why he came. He didn't come to teach you to save yourself. Here's what you need to do. Do this, this, and this. And then, no, that's not why he came. He didn't come to say that he loves and accepts you just the way you are. That's Mr. Rogers' theology, man. That's not biblical theology, right? Some of the older people are laughing at Mr. Rogers. They got that. He came to save sinners like you and me through his sinless life, his sacrificial death, Burial and glorious resurrection. That's why he came. And Paul is emphatic about that. And he said he came to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. I'm, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm the blasphemer. I'm the persecutor. I'm the insolent one. Right? That, that's me. Chief of sinners. But you know what? When Paul says that, if you're a Christian this morning, every true believer knows that about themselves. That you are the chief sinner. Right? You're the chief of sinners. If somebody were to ask you, what would you say? Yeah, I'm the chief of sinners. That's right. That's the conviction that we have because we know what we've been saved from. In our history class on Thursday night, we talked about the Puritan Oliver Cromwell. And in his testimony, his conversion testimony, he says this. I'm just going to read a little portion of it. Cromwell says this. Blessed be his name for shining on so dark a heart as mine. You know what manner of life, my manner of life has been. Oh, I lived in and I loved darkness. I hated the light. I was a chief, the chief of sinners. This is true. I hated godliness, yet God had mercy on me. That's Cromwell. That's us. That's what Paul's saying. But when it comes down to it, you know that you're the chief of sinners as well. Right? We don't say, hey, I know I'm a sinner, but he's a worse sinner than me. Not, you're not, but you know, you're, he's, I'm pointing at an empty chair. Nobody's there this morning. He's a worse sinner than me. Do we do that? No, we never do that. 
We know our hearts, man. Even though some might commit more heinous sins, perhaps. But you know your heart. You know how susceptible it is to sin. How, how deceptive it is. How weak. How easily tempted. How so quickly we're carried away. We know our motives. We know our thoughts. We know our actions. And so does he. You know. Churches. We could say right along with Paul that Christ came to save sinners. I am the foremost. I am the chief sinner. Right? That's, that's the testimony of a true Christian. It, you know, others might say, well, I'm not so bad. I'm okay. I'm not, yeah, I'm saved by grace, but that per- at least I never know, man. When it comes down to it and you know your heart and you examine yourself and you're honest with yourself, what do you say? I am the Chief sinners, but he had mercy on me. Praise God. He had grace on me. And there, there it is. He says it right along. Verse 16. But, and there's the conjunction. You guys know that little word. That little conjunction makes all the difference. But I received mercy for this reason. That in me, as foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. So among other things, obviously saving our lives and forgiving us of our sins, not only does he strengthen us, where does our strength come from? Christ. Who gets the credit? Jesus alone, right? Not only does he count us faithful for service, we're not faithful in and of ourselves. It's by his grace and mercy. He appoints us to service. We don't appoint ourselves. He gives us the gifts and talents. We try to do something that's not in his will, we're going to fail, right? He appoints us to service, but he saves us and partly, partly so that others may say, see his power, grace and mercy in you. Do you understand that? That's why you need to walk in a manner worthy of your calling in Christ. That's the, that's why you need to take it, man. That's why you need to be patient. That's why you need to be loving. That's why you need to be forgiving. That's why you need to be the husband you're called to be, the wife that you're called to be. Yeah, and submissive to your husband and loving him. And why husbands loving your wives as Christ loved the church, right? That's why you need to be strong and stand up. That's why you can't be messing around with your words and with your actions. Because you, you are a witness for him. You are on display. Paul says he dis- that he might display in me, right? So when people look at you, They should see Christ. You're like a billboard, man. That's what we're to be for Jesus Christ, his work in us. That's part of why we need to walk faith in faith and walk in a manner worthy of our calling. Not so people say, oh, you're such a nice person. Oh, you're so good. Who cares about that? But you see Christ in me, a sinner who's been saved. That's what we want to do is reflect his glory. That's why we don't flip out. That's why we don't gossip. That's why we do what we're called to do as Christians because we're on display, man. Do you ever remember Kaufman's downtown, the big windows? And you saw the displays. Why was it on display? So so that you would notice that and want that and purchase that thing. You, you're on display if you're a Christian for Christ. How's it looking? What are people seeing when they look at you? And don't give me the sap story. Oh, I'm just a sinner broken. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we are. And he knows that. But still, our light needs to shine for Christ. Don't lean on that as an excuse. We are a work in progress. We are being sanctified. But you need to understand that people are looking at you when you call yourself a Christian to see how you live. And we are on display for him, showing, pointing you somewhere. What are people thinking about Christ when they look at you? Are they drawn to him or are they drawn away from him? Or they say, oh, you're just a hypocrite, so this stuff can't be real, right? That's a real challenge for us. To live faithfully. But Paul said he did this to display his glory in me. That others may see that. That's a big deal for us. It's not how good you can be. See, to display, it's not, a, it's not how good you can be, but how great he is. Right? Salvation, true transformation is lasting change that comes through him. That's it. I'm on display. Perfect, his perfect patience as an example of those who were to believe in eternal life. 
It truly changes us. If you're a Christian this morning, I want you to understand that you have been transformed from the inside out. Yes, we still struggle with sin. Yes, we still battle with certain things that we've had. But you're not who you were. Do you understand that this morning? If you are in Christ, you're, you're what Paul teaches, the scripture teaches. You are a new, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, it's a new creation in Christ. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We're new creation. First Corinthians six eleven. Paul says, after he gives a list of sinful actions and behaviors, he says, that's what you were, man. You were that, past tense. But now, now, you're wa- you are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. What kind of witness are you for God? You're on display for him. You, you truly have been changed fundamentally changed at a heart level change romans 12 2 paul says this don't be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by the testing you may discern what the will of god is what is good and acceptable and perfect to him right that's it he changes us you're not who you used to who you were in the past you hear this all the time people say this nobody really changes how many of you've heard that right nobody no, okay, just me. <laughs> People say that. Nobody really changes. Oh, you might polish your act up for a while. You might be okay for a little bit. But, you know, eventually, sooner or later, you go back to who you always were. I always knew you were like this. This is what you're really like. And you know what? There's truth in that for the unregenerate. There is truth in that, man. Because you're not truly changed or not truly converted. You know, your 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 motivation, your motives, your heart. Still, still hasn't been transformed. So you can polish up your act. You can clean up your act for a while. But, but that's a good um, ana- um, analysis of anthropology. Like some people, you know, if you're not in Christ, you, you kind of go back to, to what you were for the most part. That, that's kind of who you always were. Listen, nobody really changes except those who have been transformed by the saving power of God through the Holy Spirit. Amen? Then you are truly transformed. Then you can truly live for him. He changes us, man, on a heart level. So that means everything about you changes. Your position changes. You're no longer going to hell. You're going to heaven. You're no longer living for yourself. You're living for him. Our desires are changed. Our priorities are changed, right? What's your priority now? Is it to live for Christ or to live as you always lived before you knew him? If it's, the, if it's the latter, then you need to come to him. Your worldview changes. We, we view the world through the lens of scripture now. This is what he commands. This is what he purposes. This is reality. And this is what we're lining up with in, in our worldview. We're looking to him, right? It better change. You can't think the same way you did before. You can't think the way the world always works in this way as it always has in that way when you have his perspective. It cha- he changes that. Your, your, your perspective changes. His thoughts become our thoughts, man. At least they should. That's how we live. We begin to live for him. And listen, as we live less and less for ourselves, and that's what the battle is, especially when it comes to displaying Christ in us. It's always that battle between the flesh, right? Doing what we've always done, being tempted to go back, living for ourselves in this way, being, right? Right? As opposed to saying, Lord, I'm yours. Do with me what you will. Help me to be faithful and obedient to that which you've given me to do. And all honor and glory unto you. As you live less and less for yourself, people will see more and more of him in us. And that's our goal. Isn't that your goal, man? That needs to be your goal. To, 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 to let Christ come through you because you're so sold out to him and you're living for him and no longer for your selfish self but for Christ alone capiche that's a big deal and that's what Paul said we're on display for him and after he says this he just breaks out he just breaks out in doxology he can't help himself and just like okay to the king of ages immortal invisible the only God be honor and glory forever and ever amen this is why this section is overflowing with gratitude. Because Paul could look back and say, that's what I was, man. I was that person. But he counted me faithful, not because of me, but because of his grace and mercy. And he loves me, and I love him, and I'm going to live my life for him. Amen? And just shouting that out. I realize that I belong to him. And when people look at me, what are they saying? This is why he's overflowing. 
This is why this spontaneously, this doxology just pours forth from him as he once again realizes the unfathomable love of Christ, mercy and grace given to the chief of sinners. That's us.